It's time for the Phil Ferguson Show. to the show. This is a very special episode. I have an author of a book called Goodbye Jesus, an evangelical preacher's journey journey beyond faith. And the author, of course, is Tim Sledge. And Tim is with me here today. How are you, sir? I'm great, Phil. And thanks for uh, having me on your podcast. It is my pleasure. I just last night finished uh, reading your book. Uh, Normally, I do audio books. Uh, so it was an extra challenge for me to fit in the time when I wasn't driving, but it was really, there were parts of it I just felt like I couldn't stop. I had to finish the story, and so I don't want to jump to the end and spoil it for the readers, um, so I kind of want to start at the beginning, and I'm sure you've heard this before, you weren't ever a real Christian, but boy, <laughs> reading this book, someone has to be insane if they haven't read this book to think that. Uh and let's go all the way back to you were a little kid. Was it eight or nine that you, you ran up front and dedicated your life to Jesus? Is that, is that about how it happened? Uh, yes, that's, that's exactly right. Um, I had received a Bible as a gift from my Sunday school class at the beginning of the school year when I was eight. And um, around uh, Christmas time, I noticed that in the back of the Bible was a, a chart that guided you through through reading the whole Bible in one year. And I decided that that would be my New Year's resolution, to read the whole Bible in one year. In one year. And so as an eight-year-old, I, I set out reading a little bit of the Old Testament every day and a little bit of the New Testament every day. And during that year of reading the Bible, I made my profession of faith, walked the aisle in my little... West Texas Baptist Church during Vacation Bible School. But one of, one of the things, and I'm, I really appreciate what you just mentioned, because part of my method in telling my story is I want the reader to know that this is a story from somebody who really meant it, who was really sincere, and who with you know, within reasonable human limits, try to do whatever faith said to do. And uh, so that that's an important point, and, and thank you for noticing that. Oh, it, it's amazing. And quite honestly, and, and again, I got thoughts about the middle and the end of the book, and we'll go over that, but, but I want to do this in order because I, I think the way you, you laid that out was important. So you walked up, you dedicated to Jesus, you, you got baptized, uh, right? There, I guess you were describing this baptismal was something you could climb into and, and everyone could see you in this tub? Yes. Uh, Baptist and some other evangelical Christian groups, um, and this, this is a big uh, area of controversy among Christians, uh, is baptism part of what makes you a Christian or is it a symbol of becoming a Christian? Is it okay to sprinkle water or to pour water? But Baptist, and, and, and the word Baptist comes from the Greek word baptizo, which means to dip or plunge. And so Baptists uh, have a big thing about you need to be totally immersed in the water. And in, the, in older times, you go to a river or a lake or somewhere, but today, uh, Baptist churches, and, and there are companies that, you know, they manufacture these baptistries there. I think they're made out of fiberglass. They're about uh, three feet deep, maybe about four feet from front to back, and they have steps. The minister walks in. The minister's um, usually wearing, like, uh, fishing waders and a white robe over that, and then the baptismal candidate comes in, and the minister lowers the candidate into the water, 
and uh, makes a statement, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then raises you out of the water. And so for Baptists, that's a symbol, but, but what precedes it is important in evangelical theology because it's important that you've made that sincere commitment to Jesus, and, and the ideology is that when you confess your sins to Jesus and when you really ask him to come into your heart, um, that, that happens, and you are born again. You are transformed. You become a new person. So the baptism uh, in, in the evangelical or Baptist view is a symbol of what just happened, but, but it's important because it's one of the ways that you show that you're going to obey Jesus in your new life of, of following him. And, of course, after the baptism and a few years later, if I use the phrase correctly, you are on fire for the Lord, and you started preaching at, what, 16? Does that sound right? Yes. Um, <clears throat> we had a new pastor came to our um, West Texas town of Odessa, which is the, the home of the Permian Panthers. The Friday Night Lights book, movie, and TV series is about the high school that I went to. It was a dynamic little town, and uh, we had a dynamic church, much more so when our new pastor came. And he was, we called him Brother Bill, and he was the kind of guy that everybody he met, he just, con he knew how to connect. He was just really Mr. Personality. And I remember the first time I ever met him, I remember where I was standing. He looked me in the eye, he shook my hand with a firm handshake, and even though I was a teenager, he made me feel like I was important. And he was interested in what happened to me in my life. And so that uh, his presence was part of what influenced me as I look back on, on what happened. But one day in the summer, during one of our worship services, I had what we call in that world a stirring. Uh, we, it was... It, it was a sense that God is trying to tell me something. And I, I didn't know what it was, but I just felt a stirring. And so I talked to Brother Bill afterwards, and uh, he said, well, we, we don't know exactly what this means, but whatever it means, the important thing is that you tell God that you're willing to do whatever God wants you to do. So I prayed a prayer uh, that day. God, whatever you want me to be, I'll be... Wherever you want me to go, I'll go, and whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. So that set the stage, and it was a few months later when we were having a revival. And at the, at, during that service, as I listened to and watched the preacher, I saw myself up there in the pulpit, and I just had a sense that I was being called to preach. And so I walked forward at the end. We always had an invitation in those services, and... Uh, I let the congregation know I am being called to preach. And I was asked to preach uh, within a few weeks at the Wednesday night service of the church. So my first sermon uh, was was shortly after my public decision. Wow. And, and of course, uh, apparently that went pretty well because you, you started doing more and being invited to go to other places. Is that right? Yes. Um and it and it uh, intersected with things that were happening to me at school, um, but but first yes, I started preaching in other churches, and I, I think at first it was probably more that here's a 16 year old guy who's totally committed to Christianity. Adults and pastors of other churches certainly liked bringing a teenager into their church who was an advocate for you know, just the things that they felt were important. Over time, I started developing my, my speaking skills, and, uh, and I, I, I started learning things. I learned, for example, if I was in a West Texas church and I, and I punched sort of hard on the idea that nonbelievers were going to hell, I, I heard a few amens, and it kind of surprised me the first time. But it's kind of like, a, you know, comedians try out their jokes, and they, yeah. they learn what works and what doesn't. Well, I learned what are, the, what are the things that these congregations like to hear. And for a while, that, that kind of 
uh, that had a lot of influence over what I said. Um, and then um, in my junior year of high school, one of my counselors called me to the office and said, I'd like you to run for president of the student body. And I, I was like, do you have the right person? Do you know who I am? And she's, you know, she said, I think you can do it. And she had to talk me into it, but I ran for the office and that involved making a speech to our student body of over 2,000 students. And I got up, and the main thing that I said, and the main thing that I remember, is that I said, well, I, you, you need to know that I'm a Christian, and that whatever I do as your student council president, I took this was all very serious, you know, to me at the time, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what I do as a Christian. And that sort of resonated, and I, I won the election, and then, so then my life changed at school because I was suddenly popular and I, I hadn't been before. So life felt pretty good to me. I was going around speaking in churches and I was being admired at school. And uh, my friends, uh, you know, I had one friend, his mom, whenever he wanted to do anything, she'd say, where are you going? Will you be home? All this, But if, she said, if, if he said he was going with me, she didn't ask any questions. That was all she needed to know. The, the point is, I was really sincere. I, I, I believed it, and I tried to live by it as much as I could. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not bragging. It's just, I'm just saying that I was sincere in my faith. That, that was the bottom line. And I, I distinctly remember a story about uh, young you, and, and maybe at the time your girlfriend, uh, hopping on a Learjet and getting to go speak somewhere. Tell us about that. Yeah, so... Um, as my high school junior and senior years unfolded, I was speaking almost every week in a church somewhere. Uh, I spoke to, we had Try High Y clubs, and they had a big annual event. Um, I found myself speaking to all the high school kids from the different high schools in our town at what they called a rededication service. Uh, I led a citywide youth rally, Billy Graham style youth rally uh, in November, and uh, we rented our county coliseum, and we had uh, over a thousand people there, had a decision service at the end. So a lot of things were happening to make me very visible, and and so in the spring of my senior year, um, a guy called me up to his office. He was the vice president of an oil company there in Odessa. And he said he wanted me to go on a speaking tour for the West Texas Chamber of Commerce. And I said, well, gosh, I, I, I appreciate the invitation, but I don't know what would I talk about. And he said, well, don't worry. I'm going to help you write your speech. And um, so I was, started going to his office, and um, he was we did a survey, and he was helping me write the speech. And one of the days I was at his office, I he motioned me to come in, and he was on the phone, and he was talking to Lady Bird Johnson. Um, they had been, you know, Lyndon Johnson was from Texas, and right. so this guy knew him. So it was a pretty heady experience for me and kind of scary. But the thing that kind of encapsul encapsulates the whole thing is that when it was time to go on the first uh, the first leg of the journey, um, when we got to the airport, there was a Learjet waiting, and uh, I had never flown in an airplane, um, and the guy sitting, I think it, there were six passenger seats in it, as I remember, and the guy sitting in the next row was, the, um, was Ben Barnes, who um, I think at the time was the Speaker of the House of Texas, and so we got in the plane, and... Uh, uh, our, our first stop was Lubbock, which is 160-something miles away, and we got there in 17 minutes. And it was it was like, wow! <laughs> I mean, what am I? What is happening? And I, I just felt really, and, and all of these things that were happening to me. Um, and this is what you do in the evangelical mindset. God is blessing my life. God is honoring my commitment to Him. All of these opportunities that I'm having are are from God, and it's a sign that 
God is pleased with what I'm doing. That's how I thought of it then. Oh yeah, I mean it makes makes sense given your uh, your frame of reference. And then you started. Did, did you first get a regular job in the church, or did you start uh, studying first? Uh, well, I <clears throat> my my pastor brother Bill um, put me in a position of associate pastor, which was just you know it was just a, a, a title, but he. He would take uh, take me with him visiting the hospital, for example, and teach me about how to do a hospital visit. Um, he would have me preach at church occasionally. Um, but then the, the next thing that that happened, I, I really skipped a step. I went off to Hardin Simmons University, which is a Baptist school in West Texas. Sure. And. Um, um, the one, of, one of the things I remember about that experience, it was the first time I'd ever taken a Bible class in college, and I, had, I was studying the Old Testament. And the, the Old Testament professor one day said, now some people are going to tell you that there is one God in the Old Testament, and he is a vengeful, angry God, and that there's another God in the New Testament who is loving and forgiving. And then he said... But don't believe that because it's not true. And this is this is so indicative of, you know, the way I looked at things then. I just, you know, said to myself, okay. Yeah. It's the same God in the Old and New Testaments. Whatever contradictions there are, they're just apparent contradictions. God is the same. God doesn't change. And I think somewhere in the book you use the phrase something along the lines of uh god said it i believe it and that settles it kind of kind of mindset <laughs> yeah that was um that that was something that um at some points in my life yes that was true now but but there's another side especially uh, by the time i had finished seminary and completed my doctoral studies um and, and th- this may be hard for someone who's never been a believer to understand, but there were a lot of things that I looked at critically, and I didn't always say, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. There were some things I wrestled with, but the key was, like if I read a liberal theologian for a class, the aim of that reading was to come out on the other end and to be able to explain why that liberal theologian was wrong. So it's like the the outcome of the story has already been stated, and that's the that's the that is the destination that we're aiming for. And so, and and this is something that really kind of um, uh, we can talk more about this later, perhaps. Yeah. But something that kind of bothers me now, as I look back, um, is that being a person with uh, really a, a lot of capacity for critical thinking. I had uh, sort of a governor on my brain, or yeah, yeah. I, you know, it's like you you can think critically, but just just so you don't go outside these boundaries, you'll a, be fine. Absolutely. So uh, you went through all this study, and you got married, and you ended up getting a job. And where was the first first job you were hired as a preacher? <clears throat> well. Um, while I was in seminary, I worked as a youth minister <clears throat> for a church in Memphis, uh, Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, first I worked there all summer, and then during the school year I would go back every other weekend. And that was a, an interesting experience. Uh, it was my first experience with the South. Uh, Texas is in the South, but Texas kind of has its own identity. Yeah. So this was Memphis, Tennessee, the real South. And one of the most memorable experiences I had there, and, and I had a great time working with youth and just encouraging them and, you know, building a sense of community. But there was an incident where, um, and, and our pastor was, for a Baptist, quite liberal. He, was, he would go and speak about race relations, and he was, very, he was actually a very good guy, and, but... An African-American family brought a child to our weekday preschool to enroll the little girl. 
And the policy was that she should be turned away because we didn't accept African-American children in our weekday preschool. That led to a newspaper article, which led to a deacon's meeting. The pastor was out of town. And I remember going to that deacon's meeting with a pocket full of tracts on what the Bible says about race relations. Because there's actually a lot in the Bible to say, if you get past the Old Testament uh, especially, to say that we're all the same and that we shouldn't treat people differently based on their color. So I had all these Bible tracts in my back pocket, but when I got to the deacons' meeting, I saw it, it, it was a very disillusioning experience because um, the, the newspaper article was saying that a group from the NAACP might be picketing our church the next day, and I heard one of the older deacons say something to the effect that if they tried to come inside our worship service and disrupt it, somebody might get killed. Um, I saw some of the younger deacons trying to, you know, keep the thing from exploding. But, but the one thing I never saw in the meeting or heard was anybody asking, what would Jesus want us to do? How does Jesus want us to treat people who are a different, who have a different skin color. And that experience, Phil, was one of what I call in the book exceptions to the rule of faith. So we're all supposed to be new creatures in Christ. We have Jesus inside of us. We have the Holy Spirit inside of us telling us, uh, you know, the right way to go. And, and the Holy Spirit is supposed to cause us to bear the Fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, and so on. But what I saw in that, day, in the, in that room that day with, the, with those deacons was just um, culturally conditioned men being frightened that there was going to be a change and that black people were going to be allowed in their church. And that, that was one of many experiences... Um, that that I call exceptions to the rule of faith. And when, when I had one of those experiences, and it's like, you know, it really, this isn't how it's supposed to work. I would file it away, sort of like a little filing place in my brain. And I would think later, you know, I'll have more education, I'll have more experience, I'll be able to answer these kind of questions. So for right now, I'm just going to put them aside. Well, when I, I kind of sidetracked you. You were asking. No, um, it, it, it's, I'm sorry. Go ahead. It's all good. We got a lot of fun things to cover. You, you did go to Wheaton College, and if I can summarize this correctly, for all this time and for many years after Wheaton College, uh, the Bible is the Word of God. The Bible is without error, and the Bible's always right. Is that a fair summary of what you thought back then? Yes, that is correct. Um, <clears throat> I ascribe to the idea that the Bible w is God's revelation of himself to humanity, that he inspired the biblical writers, and that he protected them from error in, in the writings. Absolutely. Uh, you did some work in Chicago. You did work in New Jersey. Um, and then what, after that, was it, was it Utah that you went to, or Arizona, somewhere out in the desert? Arizona, yeah, and Arizona. In, and in Arizona, was that like your church finally? You had your own church? Well, actually, um, I was the pastor of the church in New Jersey. Okay. And um, uh, that was, um, it was in a suburb of, suburb of New York City. Um, I, loved, I loved living there, and I fell in love with New York City. And actually... Uh, one of the good things about it was the Baptist, Southern Baptist, and oddly, there yes, there are Southern Baptists in the Northeast. Um, but we we had a real fellowship among the pastors, and it was it was very diverse. We had uh, African American, um, uh, Spanish speaking people, Chinese, um, French Haitian. Just uh, it it was to me that was like okay, this is what it's all about. But even there. There were experiences that uh, fell into this category of exceptions to the rule of faith. Uh, 
a guy came to my church one day and basically told me his life was falling apart, he was in debt, his marriage was in trouble. And so I talked to him as I always did, and I led him to pray that prayer of commitment to Jesus, to let Jesus into his life. And so he was born again. He, he, he did everything I asked him to. And then a few months later, I got a call that he had robbed a bank. And uh, it was a very unse- unsuccessful bank robbery. He, he only got a little bit of money, and he was using a fake gun, but scared the bank teller lady and I think caused her to have a heart attack. And he ended up in Sing Sing Prison. Wow. And so I found myself visiting one of my church members <laughs> Uh, going through three or four levels of loudly clanging, locking doors into one of the oldest prisons in the country that has within it um, an electric chair nicknamed Sparky. And uh, I, and that, that was an eye-opening experience just to go into that facility. But, but again, this is like, okay, this guy, he seemed sincere when he prayed the prayer. I, I, in fact, he was very emotional about it all, and yet he robbed a bank. So this this isn't how it's supposed to work. Another exception to the rule of faith. Yeah, and, and I, I, I'm not sure where in the story, I think maybe this was a, a couple of years earlier, you had talked about you had gotten into a habit of finding a place of solitude and, and just kind of praying, and you mentioned this to another pastor, and he said, hey, I've got a place way out in the middle of nowhere that you, you can join me to go pray. Yes, that was um, back in West Texas, and I was um, around 20 years old, early 20s. I knew this guy had preached in his church, and because I did go out into the country to pray or practice my sermons, it didn't seem odd that he was saying, well, let's go out and pray together. This is Wow, that's great, you know. So we go out to um, somewhere out in the country, and there's a windmill, uh, which is uh, about 25 feet tall with a big rotor, wind blade rotor on it, and the purpose of it is when the wind blows, it pumps water out of the ground and puts it in what we call a tank. And in this case, the tank was a <clears throat> about 25 feet in diameter, about 5 feet tall, full of water. And so when we got there, he, you know, he didn't say anything about praying. He said, you know, we, we go swimming here. Do you want to go swimming? And I said, well, no, I don't, I don't have a swimming suit with me. He said, well, that's okay. We go skinny dipping. And I, I was wondering, who, who's we? I don't know who we is. But he kept pressing me to go swimming with him out in the middle of nowhere, um, you know, uh, with nothing on. And back in those days, um, and in my world, it, it's like it took several clicks for me to get to the point of even considering that this guy is interested in some kind of homosexual uh, encounter. And I just sort of played ignorant and kind of was ignorant and then kept saying, no, I don't want to go swimming. And then, interestingly, he just abandoned all pretense of praying together and we went back to his to his church. And I, I want to say, uh, I, I don't think homosexual people are more likely to be predators than heterosexual people. That's not what I'm saying here. But this guy was, um, in years later, I heard that he was working in a school for boys somewhere over in Europe. I think he was a sexual predator. And so here you go. Here's another exception to the rule of faith. Um, we, at that point, I, you know, following the teachings of the New Testament, I, I thought homosexuality was a choice and a sin. And so how could this minister, the same denomination I'm in, how could this be? So this is another one of those exceptions to the rule of faith that needs to be filed away for later consideration. And there's also some really uh, t- tragic and sad moving stories that w- when you were in West Texas, uh, a couple of uh, teenagers committed suicide. And and again, that was one of those things that they were 
in really good families with really loving parents and they were members of the church and it looked like they were doing everything right, but yet they killed themselves. Is that something you can talk about for a minute? Yes. Uh, those events occurred in uh, Houston, Texas. The, the last church that I went to and the one where I stayed ten and a half years, um, it was a very dynamic, growing community, still is today even. And uh, so we had a lot of, um, we had all ages, a lot of young families, a lot of middle-aged families, a lot of teenagers. And we had a dynamic uh, ministry to the teenagers. So um, one of the events happened, we we had what we call a U-turn weekend, which was where uh, the teenagers would would organize into groups of about a dozen and go stay in a home of church members, and we'd have a designated leader who would do Bible studies. And it was a real kind of building unity and a lot of camaraderie. And then we'd all come back together on Sunday night, and the youth would help lead the service, and they would talk about all the good things that had happened during the weekend. So in this particular year, we we had the weekend, and the service was just really upbeat as usual. But right before we were about to dismiss, somebody walked up and handed me a note, which was that doesn't happen very often. You don't walk up and hand the minister a note while he's leading the service. And I read on the note that one of the teenagers who had attended the U-turn weekend had killed himself that afternoon. He'd driven out, driven his Jeep out into a, you know, a country, countryside area not far from the city limits and shot himself with his, his uh, own gun. And so that, and, and then during that same time period, we had uh, another teenager, another 16-year-old boy, I was called over to the house. The um, the body was still in the bedroom, and uh, I, w- I went upstairs that night, and I, I saw there were there were posters on the wall, and one of them had Bible verses on, on the poster, and there 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 was blood splattered all over the wall and on the ceiling. And this this young man had taken a shotgun and shot him shot himself. And I, I there there was so much about that. My main focus was on trying to help the parents deal with the trauma of that moment and and trying to not be overwhelmed by it myself. But I was struck as I reflected on it later about those Bible verses on the wall because and I I can't quote the four of them right now, but. But in reviewing what they each said, uh, three of the four were were being proved patently untrue by the event that had occurred in that bedroom. So that those suicides became another one of my exceptions to the rule, things that I file away and hope to figure out at a later time. Now, this church that you ended up being the minister of in Houston, West, West Houston, is that right? West Side? Yes. Uh-huh. Uh, it was a reasonably good size suburban uh, church when you took it over, but you ended up hiring more staff, um, uh, music people, uh, sec- uh, secretaries, changing out staffing, making these decisions, and the church started growing quite quite rapidly. It went from uh, a couple hundred at a service to many hundreds to a thousand, uh, and over a period of years and years and years, it just grew and grew and grew. It was, that sound right? Yes, the church um, basically the worship attendance almost quadrupled in ten years, and uh, we were growing at a rate. It was a growing suburb, so that that certainly helped. But our church was growing at a rate of almost four times the the growth rate in the community, and that was all very intentional. I had uh, prior to coming to Houston in 1985. Uh, there was a movement called the Church Growth Movement that was emerging in the 80s, and uh, I had made myself a student of, of this movement. What does it take to make a church grow? And so even as I talked with the pastor search committee, uh, before coming to the church, I, I was very clear. I want to I lead a church to grow, 
your church looks like a church that could do that, but before you call me to be your pastor, and the way Baptists work, each congregation is autonomous, so the congregation decides who their pastor will be. And um, I said, I want to be sure that you, as a congregation, are with me on this. And so the, the night that they voted to call me to be their pastor, we did a reading together that we basically affirmed some principles that were going to define who we were. And then almost immediately we hit the ground running. We started a prayer ministry where people could call in and ask for prayer. We put billboards up. We had a full-size billboard on the main east-west freeway into Houston. Um, we started um, we started uh, computerizing our outreach so that when somebody came and visited our church for the first time on Wednesday night, our leaders would come and we had printouts and we'd call them. Uh, we'd take a fruit basket to people that had just moved into the community. But, but our whole approach... Um, one of the things I see a lot in the non-theist community is sometimes shots are being taken at caricatures of Christianity, and I get that. I understand why. But um, part, of, part of what I'm trying to, to share in my book is a little bit different perspective where you have people who are uh, and, and the point I want to make here is that we were not hard sell. We were not going door to door. We were not banging Bibles. We were not screaming, uh, screaming about hell, hell, fire, and damnation. Our message was a message of love. God loves you. He want, If you will follow Jesus, your life is going to be better. It's going to be enriched. You're going to be a part of a community. You're going to have some direction. And that that worked. You know, people responded to that. Yeah, it actually sounded uh, we, sounded pretty nice. Uh, one of the other things that you added is you started doing, um, I don't know, uh, support groups using uh, proven psychological methods to uh, help people uh, uh, get past their fears, get past their mistakes, admit their mistakes, deal with their childhood. And uh, you even wrote a couple of books about this, right? Yes. Um, so... One of the things that I liked doing was preaching sermon series on topics that were relevant topics of the day. And I decided in sometime in late 1987 that I was going to do a series on adult children of alcoholics. My father had been an alcoholic, uh, not as extreme as a lot of stories you hear, but enough, there were enough issues associated with his drinking that it, that it had some effect on me. So I decided I would do this sermon series, <clears throat> and I decided that to prepare for the sermon series, I was going to go to a treatment center in Arizona for one week, not as a patient, but they had a program for ministers where you could go and participate in the groups. Um, I think the reason they offered this program was it was a way for ministers to come and see what they did and then hopefully refer, uh, refer patients to the treatment center. So I went to the treatment center in March of 1988, expecting to get material for my sermons. I was placed in an inpatient group with about six or seven other people, and within 15 minutes of the group starting, I, I realized that, you know, I'm going to have to participate in this as a, like, like everybody else. I, I can't say I'm here to get material for sermons and um, it, I, I was overwhelmed by the honesty in that room and the, and the pain that people were pouring out as they told their stories. And, and so as the week unfolded, I talked about my experiences with an alcoholic father and some of the things I had dealt with in my childhood. And before the week was over, I realized that I was having a life-changing experience. And I realized that groups were extremely powerful in terms of helping people get in touch with unresolved pain from the past. So I came back to Houston and I preached my sermon series with much more intensity than I had anticipated doing. And in the process, I started talking about 
some of my own struggles. In fact, I'd been having panic attacks for a while before that time, and I talked about that, which was very hard to do, and it, I had to be vulnerable, vulnerable um, to do that, but I just felt like it was what I needed to do. The result of my openness and talking about the topic of recovery in the church and the, and the topic of adult children was powerful. People started coming to hear the sermons from all over the Houston metropolitan area. We, um, I, I wanted to offer some support groups during the sermons. I was hoping to get five or six people together. And, and so we said, come on this certain night if you want to sign up. And we, we, had, we had 60 people, and we ended up doing six support groups. Well, over time, uh, what, what I saw was that these groups really helped people to grow, that they were characterized by honesty, just as the groups at the treatment center had been. And it was a place where people would come together for 12 weeks, be really honest about their pain, and, and get better. Um, there were some spiritual elements. We would pray for each other. We had a scripture for the week. But a lot of what was happening was psychological in nature. Getting honest, being transparent, embracing your pain so you can let it go, things like that. Well, I mean, it sounds pretty straightforward. And, uh, of course, I only have your version of the story to read. It sounds like it helped a lot, a lot of people. It, it did. And over the next, um, oh, I think it was about the next... Um, eight years, seven or eight years, we had a hundred different support groups. And eventually my denominational publishing, the publishing arm of Southern Baptist came to me and wanted me to write a book that could be used as a workbook uh, in these support groups. So in 1992, my book, Making Peace With Your Past, was published. And as a result of that, I started to travel all over the United States. I was speaking at uh, we had Southern Baptists had two national retreat centers, one in North Carolina and one in, near Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I spoke um, five different times at those uh, places in one summer. I began to travel all over to different states, churches, denominational meetings, and I became sort of a Southern Baptist guru on recovery in the church. The most striking thing about that experience for me was that everywhere I went, people were coming out of the woodwork, and many of them were ministers. And, and one of the most common phrases that I heard people say during that time was, I've never told anybody this before. And then they would tell me something that they'd been holding as a secret for decades. So this was all great, and I felt like, uh, wow, this is, I, I've touched a nerve here sort of accidentally, and I, and I was really finding my niche in ministry. But there was a troubling aspect of it that over time started to bother me more and more, and that was that these, well, I'll give you an example. We had adult Bible study classes on Sunday mornings, and I, one, one day I walked down the hall and on my left was the traditional adult Bible study, and on my right was what we called our recovery group Bible study. And in the group on the left, I saw people laughing. I heard people talking about the next ball game, about the next get-together. You know, good stuff. But on my right, I saw people with tears in their eyes. I saw people embracing. I saw people with eyes locked in deep conversations. And I began to, I began to think, does this process of, of recovery groups help people more than, than church, than the, all the prayer and all the spiritual stuff. And the way I was able to deal with it is that the process, it did involve prayer. It did involve reference to Bible verses. But, but what I understood that it was largely driven by the process of being open and honest and creating a, an, ex, an environment that accepted people wherever they were and the other thing about all of this was, as I, as I saw and heard all these people come out of the woodwork, it's like, wait a minute, 
we Christians are hurting too. But the the over the template that's been placed over us is you're born again, you have Jesus, you're healed, you're spiritually healed, you're emotionally healed. And what I was seeing, just time after time, it didn't matter where I went, uh, I, I ended up, I went, my book was translated in South Korea, and I spoke uh, for a week there to thousands of people, and it was the same thing. Christians are hurting. And when somebody gave them a chance to talk about that hurt and to say, it's okay if you're not completely healed, it was like opening floodgates. And so that began to be another one of those exceptions to the rule of faith that troubled me because um, one of the basic tenets at least uh, in the southern baptist church a lot of people would say things like all you need is your relationship with jesus you just trust in jesus and he's going to fix everything right right and it was interesting because <clears throat> this church grew and grew and kept growing 10 years Uh, You had all these support groups that were going, you had books written about this, you were traveling the world, and more and more people are being helped, but but back home, there was a small group of people who wanted things like they used to be, when it was just about Jesus and just about the Bible, and some people, and you know, water under the bridge now, but some people started to undermine you, and they actually ended up kicking you out of the church that you helped grow so much. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, yes, and uh, you you summarized it very well. Thank you. Um, um, You hit the nail right on the head. It was about changing things. Um, One man said, you know, after I'd started being more open about some of my own personal struggles, he said, I'm disappointed in you, Tim. And one of the um, slogans that we started using was, our church is a healing place for hurting people. And it got back to me that some people said, wait a minute, I don't want to be, I'm not a hurting person. I don't like that idea of this being a healing place for hurting people. And of course, the thing that was so striking about that is, wait a minute, isn't this exactly what Jesus taught? I mean, um, but one of the, This is a little bit of a side note, but one of the things that I learned in my years of leading churches and trying to facilitate growth is that it's very hard to get a church to grow because churches, like other organizations, have people in them that simply want things to stay the same, and that's a powerful battle that you have to fight. Well, so yes, it ended up with a small group, and they... They really kind of caught me at a time when I I was physically exhausted. Uh, I'd been going through a lot of uh, challenging things in in my own life, and and it's like they they knew just when to come at me. And I learned later that their tactics are common in churches when a small group decides to get rid of a pastor. They came when I was vulnerable. They said that a lot of people weren't happy with my leadership, and I said, well, who and how many? And they said, well, we can't talk about that. And they said, if you'll go, we'll, we'll pay you for 10 months, but if you don't agree to our terms, uh, then we'll just fire you, and we have, we have the votes to do it. So I thought about it a little bit, and I, I, I felt like, wow, if this is what can happen to you when you are this sincere and you work this hard and not that i was like the world's best anything but i just was i meant it i was trying my best and um i felt like you know i i i still want to be a christian but i don't want to be a pastor anymore so i accepted their offer it all comes down to a wednesday night business meeting and one of the things though is we negotiated the terms i said you've got to include in our church newsletter and in the agreement we sign and in the statement you make at the business meeting, that there are no ethical or moral charges involved in this because what was happening was so radical that I knew that that's what people would think. That would be the only reason that a minister would be asked to leave with so much 
so many good things happening in the church. And when I, so when I got to the business meeting, I said a few words and, you know, kind of explained what was happening. And about 70 or 80 percent of the people there stood up, gave me a standing ovation. And that's when I realized I'd been tricked. It was a small group. Um, most people were like, what is happening here? But, you know, one of the one of the saddest things is, and, and there were some people, one guy got up and made a motion that we fire the personnel committee and fire the deacons, and I said, don't do that. There's too much that's already happened, and I need to go. But one of the things that was interesting, there were a lot of people who were, they were such supporters of mine and such good friends, but even those people eventually would say, and I have letters from some of them, and they, the, the line that just is burned into my brain is, well, God must have some good reason for this, otherwise he wouldn't have let it happen. So even the people who were for me and were for the direction that I wanted to go eventually caved, most of them, to the idea, well, God's in control of everything, and God loves you, and God is just going to use you in something bigger and better. So it's all good. Yeah, it, it's a pretty amazing story, and I'll, I'll leave some of the details for the people that buy the book because, uh, of course, we'd like to help you sell a few copies. Uh, I spent five years pretending to be a Missouri Synod Lutheran as an atheist, as a non-believer, and... I saw politics and lying and cheating and backstabbing on a scale that I never even imagined was possible anywhere, let alone in a church. Uh, so, and maybe it was partly because of the way you wrote it, you were kind of signaling what was coming up, but I saw it. I, I, I knew what was going to happen to you cause I'd seen it before. Uh, of course I didn't know it the first time and there's no way that you being involved personally could could have seen what was what was going on underneath and behind the scenes and as a pretty much a lifelong atheist i still think you were you got it you got wronged there and you got abused and and i i feel bad for it well thank you um i i appreciate that genuine empathy for what happened to me and it was a very difficult experience i write about how it impacted me emotionally for a long time afterwards um, the interesting thing, though, is that it did not extinguish my faith. I just decided that I, I don't want to be a pastor anymore. Um, I'm going to keep writing books, and I will um, find other ways to minister, and I, and I still want to be a Christian. But, yep. but this was another one of those exceptions to the rule of faith um, added to my list. And And what I'm going to do, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to kind of skim over some of this part here in the middle two thirds of the part of the story and get to the end because you had a big search for churches. You had problems with your marriage. You met another woman. Things got out of control. Um, you got remarried, but yet you were alone. And, and I love this part where you were talking about you and your new wife were going and looking for a new church. Finally, at some point, you got sick and tired of trying to look for churches, and you just said, I'm going to stop looking for churches. And then your world started to really change. Walk us through what happened at that time. Okay. Um, so one of the things after I left uh, the church, uh, was forced out of my church, I started doing I started doing a Christian radio program in Houston. I was doing consulting. I was traveling and speaking about uh, support groups, and one of the things that I was asked to do was to go help a church in another city in Texas uh, develop their support group ministry. They had a large support group ministry there, and so I worked with them uh, for three months, uh, helping train their leaders and helping them build their support group ministry. During that time, I, I, I had a major... Um, change in my life, and it was one that I initiated, I ended up leaving my marriage. And this was something that, I mean, it was not like me. I was by the book. I, I tried to do everything that my faith told me to. But it, it was like I had reached some kind of breaking point. And uh, so I left my marriage, and 
and uh, a few years later, I got married again. And one of the goals in this new marriage was that we find a church, that we be active Christians together. Now, because of my strict Baptist beliefs, being divorced, I didn't feel I was qualified to be a minister anymore, and and I didn't try. I took myself out of the ministry. But I did want to find a church. I did want to be a part of a a fellowship that was uh, a community that was helping people, some a place that would inspire me. And so, we we visited uh, one church, and it was actually a church that used my my books and had support groups. And so I started going to a Bible study group in the home of a couple, and I was starting to have some questions about the church. And in one of those group meetings, I, I and I wasn't aiming at that church that I was attending. I was just saying, you know, church in general, what about this? And before I knew it, the hostess of the meeting was standing on her coffee table, towering over me, shaking her finger at me, telling me that I was wrong for criticizing her church. Yeah. And I was like, wow, you know. <laughs> that escalated okay. quickly. Uh, yeah, so we started visiting all kinds of churches. Uh, you, if you, We even visited a Unitarian church, and if you've been an evangelical or a Baptist, that's like, if you start going to a Unitarian church, it's like you're, you're running out of options, you know. Yeah. <laughs> that's just from my perspective at the time. Um, I don't know how many churches we visited. Um, at one point, uh, before I remarried, we had broken up, and uh, it was one of the loneliest times of my life. And I decided to go back to the church where I'd been working when everything had fallen apart, because I really liked the pastor, and I liked the fact that they had support groups. And so I arranged an appointment with the pastor, and he met me at a Starbucks. And I told him I was sorry that I'd let him down and, you know, that I'd, by ending my marriage, I'd done something that was embarrassing to his church, and I, but, I, but I was all alone. I wanted to come back. I didn't want to do any leadership. I just want a place where I can be restored in my faith. Yeah, I just show up and meet some and friends. Looked, and he looked at me and he said, uh, you know, there are two kinds of people. And some people are just broken and they can't be fixed. And you're one of those kind of people. And he got up. Well, first I said, but, and I called him by name and I said, but wait, I, I know that a third of the people in your church are divorced and remarried. And uh, I said, isn't that hypocritical? And that, when I said hypocritical, he, he became very angry, stood up, and before I knew it, was out the door. And that was the end of that. Wow. I kept trying to find a church even after that, but one day I, I would go, I'd get my hopes up, and um, I found another church where the pastor was a former uh, professional counselor, and I thought, okay, this is a good fit. And I went to him and I said, hey, could you talk to me? I, I want to be restored. I, I want to get back on track. He said, I can't do that, but my associate will see you. So he had an associate pastor who charged, uh, you know, charged a fee for counseling, and I went to see him. And I felt like something didn't quite feel right here. There's something, there's an elephant in the room. And finally, after several sessions, he told me that, he said, well, my, my wife actually committed murder, and uh, apparently he didn't fill in the details, but it was probably one of those, abusive situations where she was uh, did an act of self defense i don't i don't know but so but he started talking about it and when he when he did it's like okay now i know what the elephant in the room was but by then i felt like wow it, i get it and you you should know that i get it because that's that's my thing is accepting people wherever they are and whatever's happened and something about that this may not make any sense. I don't know if I'm communicating well here, but it just felt like um he was having trouble handling an issue in his life and he felt very uncomfortable 
trying to help me handle one. Yeah. Um, that was that in comparison to what he was dealing with was you know probably not that much. So anyway, we continued looking for churches, but finally, after going to one ch- one last service, I said, you know what, I'm not going to do this to myself anymore because I get my hopes up. I don't think there's a place for me. Um, and that felt really bad because I'd worked really hard to make church a place where people who, who were broken could could start over. But I just ended up being depressed for a day or two, and so I said, you know what, I'm not going back to church. Again, I still hadn't given up on my faith, but I just said, I'm not going back to church anymore. Well, then you started uh, doing research, and you started asking those unforbidden questions or those forbidden questions and uh, like you said in the book it, there's, there's no point in becoming a liberal christian at least for you because if you're going to start picking and choosing parts of the bible who who, who gets to decide what parts you pick and choose and it exactly. all it all kind of fell apart didn't it yes um so once i stopped going to church it was like shackles had been removed from my brain and i started thinking about things without those shackles. And there were two main things that I thought about most and changed my thinking on first. One was homosexuality, and the other was the idea of hell. Um, I had friends who had children who were now grown up who were gay, and I knew, I'd known them since they were little, and I knew from talking to their parents and from knowing the kids since they had been children that this was not something they simply decided to do one day, and it was not simply about the, who, the gender they wanted to have sex with. It was about their identity. It was something deep within them. And so I decided, no, homosexuality is not a choice, and it's not a sin, and the Bible is wrong about that. And then the other thing was hell. I started thinking about the fact that, you know, your religion is largely determined by where you're born. And... The evangelical Christian view of things is that if you don't accept Jesus, you're going to burn in hell forever. How could a loving God torture somebody forever? It just doesn't make any sense. And so I decided, okay, I don't believe in hell anymore. Still a, still a Christian, but I don't believe in hell. Um, and... Uh, So at this point, a natural option, as you alluded to a moment ago, for me would have been simply become a liberal Christian. Because if I did that, I I could believe it's okay to be gay. I could believe there's not a hell. Jesus loves everybody. Jesus is going to save everybody. But my problem was I'd studied the Bible for decades, and I knew what it said. And to me, liberal Christianity was simply a way of gradually, what it does is it gradually lets go of one belief, one more belief, as as the evidence becomes so powerful that you can't believe something, it, you know, says, okay, we're going to drop that one. And and the numbers uh, of for attendance and membership in liberal mainline churches in the U.S. would indicate that that process is going on and it's part of a dying off because it is harder to convince a new person, a young person, to commit to something when you've taken so much of it out. Yeah. Um, so I, in some ways I kind of wished I could have become a liberal Christian, and uh, I, I still have friends who are liberal Christians, and they're good people, but I just couldn't make it work. Absolutely. And I do know that... Uh the last section of the book, and I'm going to kind of wrap us up here because despite our attempts to be quick, we, we've gone over an hour already, which is great fun, but we're going to tease the book a little bit for the listeners. The last quarter of the book, man, you lay it out. <laughs> you explain the problems with the Bible. You explain the problems with the Gospels. You explain problems with Jesus, and it is a laundry list of why it doesn't make sense. Is there anything in there, particular one thing that you want to pull forward and talk about for a minute? I, I get emotional thinking about this. When I, when I look back at what I believed, and when I look at it now with just logical clarity, it's like, oh my gosh, how could I ever think that was true? Yeah. 
the answer to that is I, I, I wanted to be a good boy when I was eight years old. Yeah. I wanted to do what my parents said. I, my pastor, when I was 16, was a father figure. I became a minister. I wanted to be like him. And then you get into it, and all along the way, you have people telling you, now, don't give up on the faith. That's the worst thing you could do is to stop believing. And remember that faith is stronger than reason, and all these things. And I feel badly today. How could I, how could I believe all those things? And, you know, one of the things I want to do is make up for the the years that I spent telling people things that I now believe with all of my being are not true. And and I guess the main thing that I would say about that last section of the book where, because what happened was when I, when I really let myself think logically about things, it just, it just all came tumbling down and it's so powerful and so obvious that it's not true. Um, but the one thing I would say is that when I let myself look at everything logically, because I've been carrying these, it's like, a, it's like you're walking along balancing all these uh, spinning saucers, you know, and you're, you're expending tremendous effort to, well, yeah, God seems more loving in the New Testament than the Old, and he seems kind of mean in the Old, but here's the answer to that. Don't worry about that because. But that's, that's like weightlifting work. It's hard. When I let go of all that and just just looked at it logically, it, it made complete sense. Why is the Bible full of contradictions? Because it was written by a lot of different people who didn't know each other and there wasn't a God guiding the process. Why, why are there 30,000 denominations? Why can't Christians agree on things like how to baptize somebody or how you become a Christian? Because there's nothing at the heart of it. It was people trying to make sense of a world they did not understand, people who didn't understand germs or astronomy or anything like that. And the challenge for us today is to let go. Uh, Christopher Hitchens talks about religion being, you know, something that came from humans when they were ignorant. And yet it is so powerful and it drives the lives of so many people today. So my concern is, how can I be a non-theist who relates in a positive way to believers, who, who even connects with some of their experiences because I've been there, but who finds a way to connect and to share the truth, maybe in bite-sized doses, maybe just as much as they can handle at a time, or maybe just to be somebody's friend while we differ, but, but to be strong in saying, this is what I believe to be untrue. So my, this is why I don't believe it anymore. Sure. My question for you, would you be willing to give talks at conferences, secular, humanists, atheists, free thinkers, anything like that? Uh, yes, I would. Okay. I, I would. Um, I've, I've become a part of a group here in Houston called yeah. the Houston Oasis, oh, which is a secular, a secular community. And that's been so meaningful to me because... It's a place where I can go and, um, and you know, just be myself and be with other people who see things in a very, very much the same way that I do. And if we don't agree specifically, uh, we agree to disagree. And that's sure. a very powerful thing. So I, I hunger for those opportunities to uh, interact and to to share my story. Well, if, if someone's putting together a little conference or a big conference, how can they reach you? Go to my website, movingtruths.com, www.movingtruths.com, and there is a contact Tim Sledge tab. You can uh, fill that out, and and uh, that will send me an email. Fantastic. And, of course, listeners, once again, more and more details. I mean, this is a good size book, all the details of everything that happened to you, and then uh, uh, just a mountain of of stuff about why the bot, the Bible and Jesus and religion is a big problem. Uh, the book is called goodbye, Jesus an evangelical preachers journey beyond faith. The author who is with us now, Tim sledge, uh, Tim, I just want to thank you so much for taking time to talk to me and to, to join in and, and sharing with all of my listeners here at the Phil Ferguson show. Thank you, Phil. And thanks for the, uh, 
the detail with which you reviewed the book and uh, you, you obviously get what I'm sharing and I, I really appreciate that. Well, my pleasure. Thanks again.